I want to believe in God, and I like arguments of atheists. Odd combination? Please let me explain. The reason I like atheist arguments is because I take God seriously. God is not a game. I can't believe in God unless I understand why so many smart people, why so many good people do not believe in God. Normally, theists give arguments for the existence of God, and then atheists attack those arguments in order to show that God does not exist. I turn the tables on both sides. I start with arguments of atheists, then see how theists respond. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and this is Closer to Truth. Michael Tooley is a leading atheist philosopher at the University of Colorado. He is sure that God does not exist. Michael, do you have affirmative arguments for why atheism is a more legitimate worldview? Uh, yes, there are four that I think are quite interesting. Uh, first of all, I would argue that atheism is the default position. That's based upon the idea that when you survey the alternatives, you have a large number of equally likely alternatives, and theism is only one of those. A second argument uh, focuses upon the sorts of minds that we're acquainted with, right? And I think there's good evidence that in the case of human beings and other animals, the mind is the brain. There's no immaterial substance, right? And so there's an argument from that to the conclusion it's unlikely that God exists. A third argument, the one I think is most important, is the argument from evil, which focuses upon suffering and deaths of innocent people in the world and argues that the existence of God is unlikely. And then finally, there's an argument from the hiddenness of God. And it's basically that the existence of God is much less evident that it, than it could be. And that's not a good thing, and that provides us with a reason for concluding that God does not exist. All right, let's, let's talk about each one of them. Uh, let's start with number one, that all societies, it seems, has some sort of an innate sense of a spiritual world. So why in that, cult, with that cultural history do you have atheism as the default position? Because there are alternatives that seem to be on a par. I mean, consider, compare, for example, the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being, the god of monotheism, with an all-powerful, all-knowing, but perfectly evil being, and with the alternative of all-powerful, all-knowing, but morally indifferent deity. I would say that those three are equally likely, right? But if that's right, then you pick any one of them, the probability has to be no greater than one-third. I mean, you look at the world, it's very mixed, so that it seems to me both the idea of a perfectly good deity and a perfectly evil deity are really very problematic, and you should think that there's a deity who doesn't really care about good and evil. Or that deity has a very complex and rich understanding far beyond our understanding of what this complex amalgam of good and evil is and what an end result is. Well, I guess there's another argument. That's going to get into the argument from evil, right? I think there's some bad things in the world. I don't know what you think, okay, right? But I think the Holocaust was not, not a great idea, okay? I think the tsunamis that killed, you know, I think around 300,000 people in India, that was not a good idea, okay, right? And so there are, there are things that I think that you and I would change or prevent if we had the knowledge and power to do so, then uh, the idea is it's reasonable to conclude that uh, any being that allows that is not morally perfect. I think to make sense out of that argument, you have to add something after death. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that if humans don't survive death, then there's no hope at all of answering the argument from evil, right? But I think even if they do, it's deeply problematic, okay? If you consider, for example, you know, children who are tortured and suffer enormously, right? The question is, why, what reason could there be for allowing that to happen? And simply saying, you know, that after death things are going to be made better doesn't seem to me to be a satisfactory answer. I mean, I Certainly so, but this is part of the world as it exists. There'll be some recompense, some justice in the world to come. I mean, that, that's the only way to give the argument consistency. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, but I mean, I'm saying that even if you have those sorts of goals... It's still not good enough for not you. Not good enough. The world will still be <laughs> different and achieve those goals more effectively. Okay, let's go to number four, the hiddenness of God. So the starting point of the argument is to, first of all, to say that the existence of God could be much more evident than what it is, and then to argue that it'd be a good thing if the existence of God were more evident than what it is. 
But wouldn't that create a, uh, a very rote, mechanistic society where God was so prevalent and so certain that everybody would have this the same happy smile on their face? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're maybe thinking of a very heavy-handed God, right, who's going to be on top of you all the time. But I think there'd be tremendous scope for individuality and people could develop or not develop in various ways, okay? I respect you very much, and you don't believe in God. And so, uh, from my point of view, is that your fault or God's fault? I mean, your, your point is that it's God's fault. He could have made himself less hidden. That's right, you know, I mean, like a lot of people argue, in effect, that uh, people intentionally blind themselves, or intentionally turn themselves in the face of God and so on. I think what's going on here is the idea that if there's a God, we'll know that there's, there's a moral law and so on that's enforced, right? And so there's certain things we won't get away with, right? And the argument seems to be that, you know, that uh, you have more trouble than committing adultery and so on, right? Now, if you, if you say, which would you prefer, you know, a world where you can commit adultery without someone, you know, punishing you, right? Or a world where you have a chance to live forever, right? That's an easy choice, right? Yeah, so the yeah. idea that people intentionally blind themselves to the existence of God seems to be very implausible, right? Okay, Michael, four arguments why God does not exist. Which is the big one? Uh, the argument for evil, definitely. And I haven't asked you this. Are you an atheist or agnostic? I'm an atheist. I think the existence of God is very unlikely. Ah, very unlikely, but I, I, I don't hear zero. No, no, I'm happy it's not zero, but uh, it's very low indeed. Michael has four arguments for atheism. Atheism as default, no mind without brain, argument from evil, hiddenness of God. All good arguments, but if I'm serious about God, I need more and I know just where to get it. Daniel Dennett is one of my favorite philosophers. If I want to understand atheism, I must visit Dan. His book, Breaking the Spell, presents religion as a natural phenomenon. For our meeting in Cambridge, Dan suggests a church. Dan, some theologians would try to harmonize an all good God with an all powerful God, that those two concepts, that's and that's a tough one. Tough Other one. theologians have now come along and to say, okay, we really can't do that, so we have to compromise one or the other. Yep. They diminish the, the all-powerful. Mm. And they somehow say that there was part of God that, uh, that is the, from antiquities or everlasting, that is unchanging, and, and, and then, but there's part of God that's open and uncertain. He's done the best he can. And, 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 and they diminish the all-power and therefore eliminate the inconsistency. But in your own telling, it sounds to me like, like, like a storyboard conference at <laughs> Superman Comics. Um, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, let's see. If we, Maybe. If we, if we tone down the, the omnipotence a little bit, then we can <laughs> we'd be back in business. All right, let's do it. Um, but the idea that that little innovation of theirs is answerable to anything other than their own sense of consistency is to me just incredible. I mean, right, they're trying to tell a consistent story and they're playing by some pretty tough rules. They've tied both hands behind their backs and this is the best they can come up with. But what does that have to do with what's true? <laughs> it's just how to tell a story. Other arguments that have been used were things like, if God wants me to believe, why is he so hidden, the hiddenness of God? Yep. Another is uh, that of God is a mind, we've never seen a mind uh, outside of, a, of an mm -hmm. embodied form. Uh, are these arguments good philosophical arguments for well, atheism? Well, they are against people who hold the positions that they're addressed to. So if, if somebody really holds a position where God has a mind, and I think actually most people who believe in God do. Sure. I mean, sure. why are they praying? <laughs> to whom are they praying if God doesn't have a mind? Th then I think they're legitimate arguments. Um, what we have to face though is that um, there's a sort of shell game. Uh, uh, can I not mean that disparagingly? <laughs> yes, I suppose. In the neutral sense, there's a shell game uh, in which people who believe in God use richly personal language to talk about God. And when you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, 
and you start criticizing or asking them questions about, oh, we didn't mean anything as, as, <laughs> as crass as that. No, God doesn't have hands, doesn't have fingernails, <laughs> you know, doesn't have eyes, but he sees us. Yeah. Well, in what sense? Oh, don't ask these questions. And so they back off from the inconsistencies to a God which ends up being an incomprehensible spirit of goodness. <laughs> Do I believe in an incomprehensible spirit of goodness? I don't know, maybe. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't pray to it. It wouldn't be he. Um, and maybe there's an incomprehensible spirit of badness too. And uh, don't see any reason to believe in it, but if you do, then at least you maybe find a consistent position. And Dan's basic argument against God is, what for? He puts the burden of proof on the theist, not on the atheist. Because in the absence of God, he says, there are very good reasons why human beings believe in God. Dan is right. I do want to believe in God and that sways or skews my judgment. Can the arguments be answered? Richard Swinburne, emeritus professor at Oxford, is one of the world's leading theist philosophers. I ask Richard if I can run him through an atheist gauntlet. He'd have only seconds to respond to each argument. He says he's game. Richard, top of the list, problem of evil. God allows evil because he allows us a free choice of whether to bring about good or evil, and he makes us responsible for each other and the world. And if we're to be really responsible, we must have a choice of doing harm or good. And he also allows natural evils in order to give us the chance to uh, respond by being courageous or being patient in, in the face of these evils. God is hidden. If it were obvious that there is a God and that he had the traditional properties, we would realize it would be obvious every one of our actions was overseen by a perfectly good being who would be uh, taking account of us. And so we would be so naturally inclined to do the good that um, we wouldn't have a serious choice between good and evil. It is necessary for God to keep some distance. God is a disembodied mind and we have never seen any instance of mind or consciousness other than with embodied brains. Yes, but any account of human beings uh, has got to uh, think of them as having two parts, uh, a body and a soul, and the soul being a substance, a thing, and therefore that is a perfect an analogy for a being who is purely that sort of thing. Another argument for the non-existence of God, how about the wastefulness of the universe, all this activity, what, it's, it seems so inefficient if, if human beings are the object of, of this whole thing. Well, it's beautiful, and uh, God is not short of paint, but God has an infinite number of materials, and I think can get wa wasted in that sense. I think the question you're in effect asking is, what's good about the uh, um, vast numbers of uh, galaxies, stars, planets, and so on, which are probably almost all uninhabited? Answer, well, just look through the telescope. It's a very beautiful thing. It's a dance. And even if no one else can see it, God can see it. Just as a painting is a beautiful thing, so a living and vast painting is a beautiful thing. And that's what the universe is. How about Steven Weinberg's famous comment that the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless? It might or might not be pointless if there was no God, uh, but even so, I don't think that's right. Um, it's good in itself, the, these inanimate wonders, uh, and if they throw up life, as they sometimes do, this is wonderful. It's wonderful for anybody to have an experience for half a second, 
um, to be aware of things for half a second. But of course, even better is the ability to think and rationalize about uh, things. And above all, given that there is a God to come to know an omnipotent and omniscient being who can help us to perfect goodness and to understand uh, progressively over infinite time the wonders of the universe. How about the religious contradictions? All the different religions in the world with hosts of different doctrines which fight with each other. Doesn't this show the non-existence of God? Uh, well, uh, the, the fact of uh, there being uh, different religions, whose, some of whose essential propositions are contradictory, uh, gives us uh, the opportunity to uh, think through and think through which are right. We're not given the answer. We're asked to look around and see which makes the best sense of the world or not to bother. Well, that's my atheistic list. Uh, what do you think of the totality of it? doesn't work. <laughs> Richard is so logical, his flow of argument so fluid, I would almost believe. But point, counterpoint can go on, famously, endlessly. And arguments are not the only way that theists defend God. To explore another way, I visit my friend Nancy Murphy, professor of Christian philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. Nancy, atheists are not just attacking theist views, they have their own views. Yes. They talk about the pointlessness of the universe, the evil in the universe, the imperfections in the universe. What does a Christian theist say to all that? Well, how would you know that the universe is pointless unless you had already decided that there is no God that gives it a point? So that's definitely a circular argument and I think very easily dismissed. Well, it's, uh, it's an argument from the physical world, th that there's no apparent point to what I'm seeing with all this stuff in the physical world. But that's just assuming that this is not the uh, first stage in God's plan for a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, well what about some of the other things? Uh... Those are very serious arguments. The imperfections, the suffering, the evil. Of course, human evil, we can blame ourselves for that. And if you believe in free will, uh, as the atheists do in probably the same percentages as, <laughs> right. as the theists right. do. So human evil shouldn't be any stronger argument against God than, than for God. Um, the suffering and imperfection, those have been, I think, uh, rather intractable problems. For a long time, the standard Christian story was that suffering uh, of humans, undeserved suffering like tsunamis, earthquakes, these could all be explained as either punishment for human sin or a, a causal uh, consequence of human sin because it disordered the chain of command from God to the angels to humans to the uh, organic and inorganic world. So the chain of command is broken and then the natural world is all disordered. But with the advent of evolutionary biology, where we know that the animals were suffering for eons before humans appeared on the scene to sin, uh, there hasn't been any really good explanation for all of that suffering. But the more we know about the way the universe is interconnected, the more we see that we can't change one bit of it without changing a whole lot of the rest of it. And as science has developed, particularly what we know about the so-called fine-tuning of the natural laws, uh, we can see that the universe, in terms of its basic physical structure, had to be almost exactly what it is like in order for us to be here. Some would say that your whole argument is one of rationalization. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, it makes the point that you can't simply argue from a few uh, bits of observation to God exists or God doesn't exist. These are 
total worldviews, and you can't take someone from one of these worldviews and say, here, let me rub your nose in a few of these details, and poof, you're going to change that person's mind. Uh, I see the world in its totality differently from the way a naturalist sees it. For Nancy, one's total worldview is what counts, not any specific argument for or against God. But how do I get such a worldview without arguments? Feelings, emotions, experiences? Those scare me. I'm trapped. I need an atheist worldview. Walter Sinnott Armstrong is an atheist philosopher at Dartmouth. How does he argue for the non-existence of God? You ought to be able to give arguments for your views. And I've got three of them. Uh, the first two will depend on conflicts between different attributes of God. The first one is the problem of evil, and it depends on the conflict between God being all good and all powerful. And my best shot for the problem of evil is birth defects. They're natural evil. They don't occur because of humans using their free will. Well, I think the argument against that is that you are positing a God in, in your image and that the real God has desires and goals and purposes that are so far beyond your conception that you can't even begin in principle to, to know it. Right. Maybe he likes children to suffer. That would be beyond my ability to understand. Sure. And I mean, maybe, but I see no reason to believe anything of the sort. And as a result, I see no reason to believe in any God of that sort. The second argument is the argument from, or the problem of action, I call it, and that's the conflict between God being eternal or outside of time or changeless, even if he's within time, and yet causes things to happen in time by answering prayers and performing miracles. I don't think you can have it both ways. The third argument, it's the argument from ignorance. As I see it, there's very little reason to believe in gods, even types of gods that don't have those attributes I talked about earlier. And yet, if God existed, you would have better reason to believe in God. So since you don't have better reason, you shouldn't believe in, uh, in any type of God. Because, for example, if I say uh, there's no cockroach in this room, because when I look around, I don't see one, that would be a horrible argument, because I wouldn't see it even if it was there. But if I say there's no elephant on this table, how do I know that because I don't see one, then uh, that's a good argument. Assuming it's a normal elephant, not an invisible elephant or a elephant or a tiny elephant. If it's a normal elephant, I would see it if it were here. And therefore, the fact that I don't have good reason to think there's an elephant on this table, it's good reason to think there's no elephant on this table. And I think that's the analogy that applies to God. If because God, God would be more an elephant on this table rather than a cockroach someplace in this God's bathroom. God's a big guy. How yeah. could you miss him? Right. Maybe the kind of God that you would see would need to be a God that, that is so obvious in the world. And maybe that's not the way the world is designed to be. Well, we have to look at the concept of God to see when this argument applies and when it doesn't. God seems to appear to believers when they're emotional <laughs> in services. Doesn't appear to the criminals that are about to hurt people. And so uh, because there's not good evidence for those people that need to have God appear to them, that's a reason to think that at least a God of that good sort doesn't exist. To many who believe in God, Atheism is a bad word. To me, atheism gives intellectual confidence, spiritual sustenance. Because I so want God to exist, I fear desire swamping judgment. I dread accepting God for wrong reasons. Bad arguments for God do me no favor, and God no honor. And maybe there's an incomprehensible spirit of badness, too. Atheists keep me grounded. I learn from atheists, the smart ones. 
their attacks sharpen my sense, if there is a God, of what God may be like. I distinguish between the possible truths of God and the undeniable defects of religion. No matter how reprehensible the religion, nothing follows for or against the existence of a supreme being. I find myself agreeing with atheists' arguments, just not with their conclusion. This may sound heretical from someone who yearns for God to exist, but digging into atheism brings us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.